So you ask an atheist what happens when you die. And you get this response usually. Oh, it's easy. It's just like before you were born. You disappear into nothingness. You have no consciousness whatsoever and you become nothing. Just like before you were born. It didn't bother you then. won't bother you now. Now, they seem not to notice the problem with this answer. Or they don't recognize that this presents a problem for people. Because people hear that answer and they go, well, that's terrifying to me. I find that terrifying. And then they go, well, it doesn't matter if it's terrifying, it's just how it is. It's not terrifying to me, I've solved the problem. That's what they'll tell you. Seemingly in good faith. But as I've said in the past, it's really, really easy to come up with any sort of intellectual justification for what happens when you cease to be. It's easy when you're young, when you're 25, because you're not dealing with it as a present reality. You're dealing with it as some theoretical far-off country that you will visit one day, maybe. But you don't really experience it in your body. You don't really know that it's coming. As you get older, okay, as I am, and you pass the age of 45, you start experiencing the oncoming mortality as a present-day reality. You can feel it in your body. You can feel the slowing down and the decline in yourself. You can see your hairs, and it gets quicker and quicker every single year. So you need some sort of real, real solve, real salvation real answer to the problem of death and a glib intellectual justification just ain't going to cut it because you can you can ex you can think that that's the right thing and still be terrified now one of the reasons why i recognized young when I, or one of the reasons why i walked away from agnosticism when i was younger is because i started reading the atheist take the atheist philosophers take on reality and particularly they grapple with death all the time and one of the things they notice that your present day atheist doesn't seem to notice, okay? They agree that you cease to be. And, and it's just like before you were born, you disappear into nothingness. And it was as if you never existed. But they recognize the problem they're in. Most, most famously, Camus wrestled with this. Is why do anything then? Why write a book? How do you come up with any justification for life whatsoever? Because at that at root, that means life is completely and utterly meaningless, completely without reason. Meaningless, absurd is the, is the word that they came up with. Because they recognize the absurdity of that, of achieving anything in the face of that. If death is just complete annihilation, just like before you were born, and you just disappear into nothingness as if you never existed, then what, what, difference, what difference at all does it make if you write a book as opposed to kill yourself? Why choose one above the other? And they, they meant this real, as a real question. And think about it philosophically. That makes complete sense as a philosophical question. Think about it philosophically, not don't automatically react, well, because life is so. Now, that's as a real question that makes sense. If life is just, you, death is just, you disappear into nothingness and it was if you never existed, then why write a book as opposed to kill yourself? What possible difference does it make? Oh, because people are going to read it, you know, for posterity. Well, you're not going to be around to see it or experience it at all. If everything just disappears into nothingness, there's absolutely no justification for life right now, period. That's why I recognized that it wasn't true. Because something deep inside of me recognized that this was not a possible reality of the life that I was experiencing. And this wasn't a fake experience. It wasn't, I just don't want to believe it. Oh, I'm so scared of that. It was that there's no way that this can be true because I know deep inside of my heart and soul that there is so much more meaning to life than that. That life is on some level profoundly important and sacred. That it's deeply meaningful, charged through with meaning. And what you do, if, you, if life just ends the way an atheist says it ends, then what you do today is of no importance whatsoever. And you can, you can come up with all sort of philosophical, fake, you know, these are my raison d'etre, these are my reasons for being, but they're fake. They're constructions. They're intellectual constructs. They aren't real. Because if you die and poof, that's it. It was if you were never born, then there is no inherent meaning to anything. There's no reason to not kill yourself as opposed to write a poem. No intrinsic meaning whatsoever. Now, you ask an atheist, what gives your life meaning? 
and they'll do two things. Usually, they'll steal from you, the theist. They go, oh, my life is profoundly meaningful. It's charged through with meaning. You know, oh, the I have the beauty of my family and the beauty of sunsets, and I go to an art museum and I see all the beautiful works of art and poetry and music, and, you know, everything I do is charged through with so much more meaning than you, the Christian, because it's, I recognize its temporariness. Never hearing the cognitive dissonance here. The cognitive dissonance is this. This is the very same person who five minutes later in the feed was, was telling you that your God isn't good because the only thing he seems to do is give kids cancer. Not recognizing this cognitive dissonance. What gives your life meaning? All the beauty of the created world. All the beauty of sunsets and my beautiful family, how much I love them. And, and I'm so charged through with love for the majesty of existence. And never giving one ounce of credit to the creator. All the, the creator didn't create any of that. All he did was give kids cancer. That's all he does. He gives kids cancer and then snickers when they can't get healed. <laughs> and then you bring them to the healing meeting, they don't get healed. And he just goes, ha, 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 ha. Ah, I'm so evil, I love it. This is why we Christians have faith in God. This is, where, this is the source of our faith, is that we recognize, as so many of you the atheists do, the beauty and the goodness of the life that we, that we, the world that we inhabit. We recognize so much good in this world, overwhelming, and then we, we follows from that. We make a conclusion based on faith. If, the, some, if something in the creative, created world is beautiful, it follows by faith that the source of that beauty, that that is just a pale reflection of the source of that beauty. If I see beauty in the created thing, then that beauty must be magnified by the thousandfold in the creator himself. And then we search the scriptures trying to find that being. Not search the scriptures trying to negate that being, which is what you do, but try to find him. Those who look for me, find me. That's the promise of God. Take him up on that offer. Because he's worth you looking for. He's worth you investigating. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, including his goodness, including the beauty and majesty of his being, and the glory of a king to search him out. You see, you're not making an honest inquiry, atheists. And you can't fool me into saying that you are because I know you are not. Because he is there to be found, and you just don't want to see him. And he is there, reflected in all of the beauty in the unfolding majesty of the created world. If it has any beauty in it, then multiply that into the hundredfold when you talk about the creator himself. Because it follows that the, create, the, the, the created thing cannot be more majestic and beautiful than the source. 